In our panel, uh, Zhou Hai joins us from Beijing. He's a research fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Joining us here in Washington is Sean Ding. He is a co-founder and CEO of G-Risk, a global risk analysis company. Michael Johns is co-founder of the na and national leader of the U.S. Tea Party movement. He joins us from a town I know very well, Bethlehem in Pennsylvania. And joining us from Edmonton, Canada, Gordon Holden. He is the director of the China Institute of the <coughs> University of Alberta. Thanks so much uh, for all of you for joining us. I mean, we've heard uh, the US spin for the last 24 hours, so I think it's, it's good that we start uh, in Beijing. Uh, Zhao Hai, uh, uh, Liu He on his way back uh, to Beijing. What led to the impasse here? Well, I think uh, looking from Beijing, I think the talk continues. And uh, we didn't think that the talk is breaking down. There are setbacks uh, in this negotiation. That's uh, normal. Uh, however, I think there are problems uh, moving forward we need to solve. There's still time remaining uh, as both sides recognize. And during this time, we have to uh, reorganize, rec recognize the problem and try to address it. I think at this point, there are some uh, misunderstandings and misinformation coming out of the U.S. Uh, first of all, China did not uh, misread the situation or underestimate the Trump administration. There are uh, some people believing uh, in the U.S. that uh, China miscalculated and therefore put uh, forward uh, a draft that the U.S. side cannot accept. However, we think that uh, we didn't back backtracking uh, anything from the Chinese perspective. There are certain things we cannot give and certain concessions we cannot make. If it is not in the Chinese interest and if, if it is not in line with China's aim of economic reform. So I think moving forward, the U.S. should uh, probably rethinking about their strategy and uh, uh, making more uh, understanding of China's position and what China can do uh, in a realistic way. Um, thanks. Michael Johnson, uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, the home of Bethlehem Steel, uh, until uh, it went away with, with a lot of manufacturing in this country. Um, what do you think of this latest uh, uh, tariff hike? You know, just 10 days ago, uh, everyone was talking about some sort of signing ceremony potentially between the two presidents at Mar-a-Lago. What happened with this 180, do you think? This is a problem that's really snowballed over uh, three or four decades of essentially mutual neglect, this growing trade deficit and the disparities in, in trade policies in both countries. So I think it's reasonable to expect that it's going to take a little bit of time to work that out. I think you have to look at the departure statement today by the Chinese delegation and also uh, comments out of uh, the Trump administration as encouraging that talks are going to continue. And the issue really becomes addressing a series of policy reforms that not just need to be made, but need to be made in an enforceable way, which in the U.S. position means you know, trying to codify as much of those as possible into actual law. And that really ultimately, I think, is a reasonable objective and one that both parties should be able to meet. If that's done, you should see, uh, I think, a problem of four decades uh, slowly begin to uh, resolve itself and trade relations between these two economic powerhouses um, begin to stabilize. Okay, uh, Sean, um, let's see if you can elucidate on, on the sticking points. We all know there's been debates over intellectual property, technology transfer, market access, and also buying more stuff, essentially. Um, but you heard, um, hinted, um, let's play um, the second uh, uh, bite of him, uh, that there are principles here that are unmovable. Let's play that and I'll get your reaction off the back. Oh, we don't have that. Let me read it to you, actually. Two signs have reached consensus. Oh, here we go. The two sides have reached consensus on many aspects. But frankly, disagreements still exist. We believe these are important issues of principle. Any country will hold on to its own principles. When it comes to principle, there is no giving in. What are we talking about principles here? I mean, China obviously very jealously guards its sovereignty. There's a lot of history here, uh, too. Is that where it, it basically the U.S. ordering it to change its laws? Well, first of all, Nathan, I think uh, the trade war or the trade dispute is never just about trade. It is a three-dimensional mm, dispute a point. between China and the U.S. It is trade technology, uh, IP, intellectual property, uh, cyber. That's one thing. That's on the economics front and the business front. 
you also have a political dispute between these two countries, and that political dispute uh, permeates into both the international arena as well as their respective domestic uh, constituents. And the third uh, um, dimension, the third aspect, is geostrategic uh, rivalry or dispute between these two countries. So I think for the first pillar, anything related to trade or to buying goods, to protecting IP, to um, uh, improve China's investment climate, we've already seen a lot of goodwill from the Chinese side. For example, right after the two sessions this March, China passed the foreign investment law in really unprecedented pace. Yes, it was quick. It only yeah. took them a couple of months to, to, mm. to pass the entire law. I think that was indication that China was very serious about uh, continuing on the reform and opening up uh, trajectory. Now, some of the issues in this package deal that probably President Trump wants deals with a lot of the political and the geostrategic issues. And I think those are the issues that China probably does not want to see written down in a document. Uh, that, excellent points. Um, I want to bring in uh, uh, Gordon now in Canada because uh, you are no stranger to tariffs in Canada. In fact, uh, there are steel tariffs uh, still on Canada and, uh, a, and also a, uh, a big uh, trade deal still yet to be signed. In fact, I want to play for you uh, a, a, a soundbite of President Trump because he seems to go against economic thinking largely when it comes to tariffs and then we'll get your answer off the bat. I happen to think that tariffs for our country are very powerful. You know, we're the piggy bank that everybody steals from, including China. We've been paying China $500 billion a year for many, many years. China rebuilt their country because of us. Little bombast there at the end as well, uh, Gordon. Uh, but tariffs seem to be a policy that this U.S. president isn't afraid to wield and continues to up. I'm not a big fan of tariffs. They smell to me very much like taxes, and I mm. respectfully disagree with the U.S. president on the question of who pays them. Uh, it's pretty clear to me these are paid by U.S. corporations, often eventually by U.S. consumers, companies that import uh, Chinese goods. It has a, an inflationary effect on the U.S. economy. I see this as a, a net negative. Um, but I think it, um, beyond the, the tariff issue itself, this almost a dialogue of deaf, some uh, of the deaf sometimes between the two parties. Here I'm thinking China and the United States. The U.S. is making very heavy duty asks of China. And China is not a monolith. There are groups in China that are not keen to change the way the business is done. This can't be done on the turn of a dime. My fear is that under this pressure of let's make a deal in 48 hours, a few more rounds, um, I know that may not be possible. I would have been quite happy to see a compromise with a deadline, perhaps, that would have given both sides a little bit more time to sort out an arrangement that might last longer. And I agree very much with the earlier comment that trade doesn't exist in a, vo in a vacuum. Mm. It's not a sealed box. There's a risk of contamination, if this goes badly, of the broader relationship with the United States uh, and, and China. And that benefits no one. And quite frankly, other countries that depend on trade, Canada and others, uh, will suffer as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, it is very political. And even though Giles was saying at the top there in his report from the White House that it could take three weeks for these tariffs to really hit and everything, politically, it's done, isn't it? Let's go back to Beijing, Zhao uh, Hai. Um, not only, of course, have we got these new tariffs coming in, which is going to vastly uh, increase costs of doing business, uh, but also, as we heard, uh, Robert Lighthizer, the U.S. Trade Representative, preparing uh, basically to tariff the next $300 billion worth of uh, Chinese imports into the U.S. Um, what can be the Chinese reaction to that? Well, that's precisely the problem, isn't it? I mean, from the very beginning, the U.S. is choosing the wrong tools to achieve their uh, goals of trade negotiations. They impose uh, tariff uh, one wave after another, increasing, uh, believing that tariffs only uh, uh, will hurt China and not hurt the U.S., which is the opposite. Uh, the tariffs hurt everybody, the U.S. consumers, Chinese producers, uh, and also around the globe. So China has been playing very responsibly and maturely trying to persuade the U.S. to roll back the uh, uh, 
uh, the tariffs if we have a deal. That's number one. And then number two, I want to uh, go back to the previous comments talking about sovereignty and political issues. Mm. I think currently the real problem is that the U.S. Uh, during the negotiation is actually raising the bar, not the Chinese side. The U.S. is raising the bar and trying to interfere into China's domestic politics. For instance, legislation is China's sovereign right. And China can make a trade deal, but China cannot promise for the U.S. to have an enforcement or some kind of implementation mechanism interfering into China. China's domestic politics. And that's principle. That's, I think, uh, in many ways what uh, Liu He has been talking about. And in terms of retaliation, I think China has its countermeasures. Uh, we can wait for exactly what China is pulling out. However, I think uh, it's not um, rational at this point for China to just counter tariffs, because tariffs only is a tax on your own country's people, and China understands that. So why should China uh, uh, go in tit for tat uh, in terms of tariff with the U.S.? It's not making any sense. So you're suggesting maybe an asymmetrical approach, uh, uh, potentially. Um, uh, Michael Johns, uh, The Art of the Deal was the bestseller. We saw The Apprentice. Uh, you know, uh, the U.S. president is um, widely acclaimed as a great businessman. Um, has not, but these tariffs have been on for, what, uh, a year? Um, he's talked about trade deals, but none have actually really passed. We've got the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, MCA about to be passed, uh, uh, still stuck in Congress, rather. This deal hasn't happened. There's problems with the Europeans. Japan hasn't even got started. Uh, this is meant to be a president who brings home the bacon in terms of trade, but over halfway through his administration, first term, and this hasn't happened. We, well, in the case of the U.S.-China trade relationship, these are the most serious uh, trade related discussions that have happened perhaps in our lifetime. And as much as there's been a lot of uh, criticism of President Trump's reliance on tariffs as a mechanism we should point out for getting rid of tariffs, tariffs have been a centerpiece of China's trade policy for decades. Those who are now criticizing the U.S. institution of those tariffs have been hauntingly silent on that question for the last decade. And, you know, I think it's reasonable to ask ourselves if the approach the president is, I believe, correctly taking in these, in these trade negotiations is, is not the right one, uh, where has been the right one over the last uh, uh, th three to four decades? Because we've seen this trade deficit go from about $84 billion in 2000 to uh, $420 billion last year. And, and there's been seemingly no constraint to it. And the issues as it relates okay. both to illegality and cheating and unfair trade practices okay, have Michael, continued Michael, in, in seeming perpetuity. Michael, I want to I want to follow up with you here. Um, I just want to pick two points to you here. First of all, uh, some people say that actually the U.S. economy is the one that needs fixing. It, it spends too much, sucks in excess capital and, and products from around the world, uh, including uh, China, hence the trade deficits. And also, if you really wanted to get tough on China, why did you alienate all your allies on the trade front, not join TPP, stop uh, negotiations with the Europeans, uh, threatening uh, sanctions on cars as national security from Japan, all that? Why didn't you build that coalition to pressure Beijing rather than try and go it alone? Well, I mean, firstly, I would disagree with your characterization of the U.S. economy. We have a GDP in the first quarter that's over 3 percent. Uh, if that sustains itself, as it likely will for the rest of the year, that's going to be the first time that's occurred in the U.S. economy in over a decade. Over 5 million jo jobs have been created okay. by this president since he came okay. into office, lowest unemployment in half a century. Okay. I know the, I know the uh, This is an economy humming on all... Those, those aren't... No, those aren't talking points. Those are facts. No, no, I, I, uh, I, I get it. But it's just, economy I, it's not the question I asked. Yeah, and then, and, and secondly, as it relates to coalition building, these are bilateral uh, trade relationships between the U.S. and China. Uh, it is in every country's uh, empower, they're empowered to, and and, uh, and essentially charged with determining what they want want to do. Um, to, I think complicating the trade relationship in a way that involves, you know, multiple countries actually makes this even more difficult. And there's been some historical examples of that. Uh, this already is an immensely complicated negotiation. It's kept most simple by keeping it a bilateral trade uh, negotiation. And I think that's ultimately the way to approach it and the answer to your question. Okay, thanks. Uh, Gordon, uh, you know, Canada's been through uh, uh, um, negotiations recently with 
uh, the United States. Uh, everyone has their areas where it's very difficult. Agriculture, for example. The farmers here in the U.S. have taken it on the chin because of retaliatory tar tariffs from China, especially when it comes to soybeans. Uh, they now have got to go through more pain. Um, this is going to be difficult, isn't it, for uh, this president to try and keep that coalition going politically uh, for his re-election if, if things aren't getting better. Absolutely. Now, it's really not for me as a Canadian to comment on U.S. domestic politics, although you've <laughs> asked me that question. But I would, I would argue that, yes, um, trade, economics, and politics are, are never separate, not in China, not in the United States. 2020 is looming very close in the U.S. electoral system, and yes, uh, the Midwest is key and agriculture is key. Um, many of these states, their number one uh, trading ex export destination is Canada, mm. uh, but China would be a close second. Uh, this, is, this is a challenge going forward. And to be fair, I, while I'm not a fan of tariffs and the, America, the President's approach in that regard, um, there is modernization and greater openness required of the Chinese economy as well. My concern is simply, I don't think that a couple quick rounds of high-level discussions uh, that it's reasonable to expect the Chinese to remake their entire economic system. Uh, but responding with tariffs may not be the right approach either. I would love to see these two get back together. I don't really care if it's a multilateral solution or a bilateral solution. But when international trade diminishes, I think we all suffer. So, Sean Ding, where do we go from here? Because uh, uh, even though the president uh, tweeted out that basically uh, they were constructive, that we're going to continue talking, Steve Mnuchin said actually the opposite in the, in the corridors of the White House. Uh, they said, oh, we have nothing planned. So where do they go from here, considering the tariffs are, are going to kick in? Uh, the U.S. Trade Representative is going to examine the other $300 billion. China will come up with some sort of response. Mm -hmm. This looks like it, uh, you know, we're, we're in a downward spiral. Well, Mason, I think, uh, first of all, this is definitely not as good as we expected, no. but it's not as bad as we fear. Because if you recall, uh, few, a few rounds of trade talks last year, I think, in Beijing, uh, people achieved a similar moment of joy where they decided, okay, you know, we're going to have a lot of agricultural product purchases. We've solved many of the problems. Everything was positive. But then overnight, the American side, after they returned to, the, to Washington, D.C., they changed the rhetoric. So I think for this time around, because the China-U.S. dispute, as I described earlier, has been a structural challenge to these two countries. And structural challenge challenges require structural solutions. And it's not going to be such a linear sort of 11 round or even 12 round of trade talks, but rather a, uh, a long process that would require both countries to work toward an agreement. And I think, I do believe in Vice Premier Liu He when he said that uh, there will be still con consultations between the two countries. They're not going to just stop talking to each other. I think these sort of uh, discussions and exchanges will still happen, perhaps under the table, perhaps not uh, open to the media and open to political scrutiny, but I think this will still continue and we're still yet to find out how these two great powers will figure out a solution to their structural challenges. Uh, do you think the, uh, the hawks, the China hawks now have gained the upper hand in trade? Because we are seeing hawkish China sentiment on the other legs of the stool you mentioned earlier. Well, I think in Washington DC definitely see uh, a lot of consensus among uh, Congress, Pentagon, the intelligence uh, agencies, uh, even the business community. Right now, everybody's getting hawkish toward China. I think Lindsey Graham just today made a statement saying that he's, uh, he supports President Trump's uh, 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 trade uh, negotiation tactics or efforts. Yes, when you have Lindsey Graham and Chuck Schumer on the same side of it. Right, exactly. So I think that's definitely something that China would have to worry about, and that's something that would really continue into uh, 2020 as we go into the election year. Uh, but again, in 2015, nobody would have foreseen Donald Trump's election as president. In 2019, I don't think we can, with confidence, foresee that you know, after uh, a year or two, the two countries wouldn't solve this problem uh, and get back get the relationship back on track. It will require tremendous effort from both sides to convince uh, not only their top leaders, but also the stakeholders, the businesses, the legislators, uh, even you know, nonprofit organizations, startups, that you know, it's in their best benefit to work together. So it's a long road, but I do, I do remain optimistic. 
Xiaohai, do you believe there's a sort of uh, a blame China aspect going on as we enter this political season here in the United States? Uh, presidential campaigns are known for being very long, and we have a long field of candidates on the Democratic side, many of which are actually echoing the same language and rhetoric about China that the U.S. president is. Well, <clears throat> I think uh, the U.S. has its, its own domestic issues, uh, and it's very complicated. I, I think, really, uh, I don't think at this point uh, President Trump is really having farmers' interest in his heart. Look at uh, the people surrounding him. Uh, they're actually uh, taking more seriously of the blue-collar jobs in probably northeastern uh, part of the U.S. more seriously. But uh, that, that said, I think... Uh, I want to stress this. I think, yes, on the one hand, structural issue is a long-term issue. We need to address this carefully. However, I think there's also urgency uh, because of the tariff, the, the way that the President Trump is imposing tariffs and, and is preparing for more tariffs, and it's going to inflict pain for both the U.S. and Chinese side. So I think we're uh, both sides under a lot of pressure to resolve this issue, at least a temporary uh, solution for this as quickly as possible. Uh, so, and, and also remember, uh, before this, uh, to this round of talks, people are talking about 90% uh, of the deal has yeah, already been 90, done. So yeah. I think both sides need to clinch it. Yeah, need to clinch this opportunity uh, and really be realistic <clears throat> and making the demands uh, operable and, and be more adaptive. So hopefully uh, in the next uh, uh, less than a month, they reach some kind of temporary deal. So Xiaohe, you, you don't think it's tempting for the Chinese leadership to try and wait until the next election and see if there's a different president? No, I, I don't think China will wait that long. Um, China, I think uh, for uh, quite some time now, China has expressed the willingness to reach a deal. And, uh, to, to, and Liu He also said, that Vice Premier Liu He also stressed that China does not want innocent people to be hurt in this process. Uh, so I don't think uh, the, this so-called delay strategy is really on the Chinese side. Michael Johns, you know, uh, the Republican Party for a long time was the party of free trade. Uh, you, a founding member of the Tea Party, uh, did a lot to change that. Um, are blue-collar workers, farmers still behind Trump? Because, uh, you know, he won uh, the presidency on about 70,000 votes in three states, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Uh, that is going to be a knife edge again. And if, if jobs don't come back and they're still suffering because of tariffs, that's going to be a big problem, right? Well, but 2016 also was in many way, ways a referendum on the issue of uh, China trade policy and the president made it a very centerpiece of all of his stump speeches and all of his debates and the American people embraced that and they still do. In fact, I think as was correctly pointed out earlier, you're starting to see even the Democratic Party come around to the conclusion uh, as uh, Senate Majority Leader tweeted earlier this week that we need to stay tough on this because the goal is to get resolution um, for a problem that has been going on for you know way too long and it's cost the united states a lot it's been unfair in every respect and in fairness to china i think as the president's pointed out uh, we haven't really gotten serious about trying to resolve it until this administration and this is not a party of protectionism this is not a party of tariffs it's important to keep in mind the goal of this entire process is to get rid of those tariffs. Okay. And uh, sadly, a mere request, ha uh, which has been done by prior administrations, has not been enough to get that done. Uh, Gordon, uh, you're north of the border in Canada. Uh, there is frustration that, that, that Canada still steel tariffed, right? And could you see more cooperation uh, between the US and Canada on China, for example, if they weren't there? Potentially, but quite frankly, my sense is the U.S. administration doesn't necessarily have the traditional view of allies or alliances or coalitions of countries mm -hmm. with yeah. similar views. So I think we're dealing with a very different um, U.S. president. It is true the Republican Party has traditionally been uh, the party of free trade, and, and we benefit from that very much negotiation of NAFTA and other trade arrangements. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a new situation now. Uh, when I was in Beijing and in Washington in April, I sensed a hardening in both capitals of views towards each other. That makes me nervous. On the other hand, um, it's clear to me that both countries, China and the United States, will benefit more from an agreement than they will um, gain from any breakup. In fact, there's a lots of downside there. Okay. So while it's tempting for either Republican or Democratic candidates for president to campaign against China in, in some sense, it's also, I think, 2020 is still a ways away 
Uh, I think it's also in President Trump's interest okay. and America's interest to, to find a deal in some fashion. Xiao Hai, um, perhaps it's an unfair question, but who do you think can uh, absorb more pain, the U.S. or China? Uh, I think that President Trump believes that uh, China will uh, suffer more, but uh, I think China can endure longer. <laughs> well, um, we'll leave it there. I, I, I unfortunately think that we might, might have to be tested on this one uh, on both sides of the Pacific. The G2 it seems a long, long time ago. Guys, that was a really good discussion. Thank you from all the way from Beijing to Bethlehem and beyond. Thanks to all our guests. Uh, that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Nathan King, Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for being with us. Really appreciate it.